right. So once again, um, our first speaker is Megan McNally. Uh, she is currently a Lillian Pengood Soriano 49 Fellow at the Museo de Louvre and a 2020 graduate of Wellesley College. This morning, she will be speaking on Stubborn Women, Wellesley College's Antigone. So welcome, Megan. Thank you. So today I'm going to be speaking to you about a book um, from Wellesley College's special collections. And this is a libretto for an opera adaptation of the Greek tragedy Antigone. It was printed in Paris in 1790 at the start of the French Revolution. When I began working with this book, we knew that it likely um, from the binding belonged um, to a member of the royal family. And I now believe that individual to be um, one of three women um, of the Royal Court of Versailles, the sisters Marie-Josephine, Comtesse de Provence, and Marie-Thérèse, Comtesse d'Artois, or their sister-in-law, Clotilde de France, Queen of Sardinia. So I'll start off with some of the evidence pointing to their ownership and then talk about um, a little bit more about the book itself and what it may have signified to them and to others in their era. Um, so right here on the screen, you see an image of the book's cover, and then I've enlarged the coat of arms because we're going to be focusing on that. So in this period, books were typically sold loose leaf without a binding, and then um, whoever bought the book would decide if they wanted to bind it, how much they wanted to spend. Oftentimes, if someone had the money, they would put their books in identical bindings, oftentimes with their coat of arms. Um, and this coat of arms tells us a few things right away about the individual this belongs to. So if you see these two ovals here, that means we're looking at a married individual. Um, and this one of the three fleur-de-lis, very recognizable, that is the coat of arms of the Bourbon family. They're the ruling family of France um, and Spain at this time in the late 18th century. Um, and the other piece that's kind of um, a big clue early on is this crown. It looks purely decorative, but it actually has an important purpose. Not everyone could use this particular crown. It's an open coronet with three fleur-de-lis. It could only be used by a prince or princess de sang, so a direct blood relative of the king. So we're looking at someone pretty high up within this family, but it's a huge family, a lot of suspects, so we really need this other coat of arms to help narrow it down. And this one's a lot more complex. Um, so a few elements like the eagle, um, the line rampant, don't help us a lot right away because they're very common across a lot of coat of arms. Um, if we look at, I know the details are a bit tricky because um, of the way it, it's stamped, but there's a cross surrounded by little crosses. That is the coat of arms of the city of Jerusalem. It gets co-opted into different royal family trees throughout European history. But what's really distinctive is um, this cross surrounded by heads in profile. That is the coat of arms of the Kingdom of Sardinia. And at this point, um, the Kingdom of Sardinia is ruled by the Italian royal house of Savoy. So if we look a little bit at the Bourbon family tree, um, and I've tried to simplify it as much as I can for you, but there's a lot of them. <laughs> um, so it's, I know it's a bit confusing, but if we look here, um, in the early 1770s, there are several marriages between the children of um, the King of Sardinia and the grandchildren of King Louis the Fifteenth of France. So King Louis the Fifteenth, his grandson Louis the Sixteenth, is married to Marie Antoinette. So they're kind of the king and queen of the Revolutionary Era. And Louis the Sixteenth has two brothers, the Comte de Provence and the Comte d'Artois. They marry Marie Josephine and Marie Therese, um, sisters. And then Marie Josephine and Marie Therese, their brother Carlo Emanuele, marries Clotilde de France, who is um, the sister of these three here. So I've tried to put those Italian siblings in bold to make that a little bit more clear. Um, so I'll take us back to um, the slide here. So to kind of establish that connection a little bit further, we can look at different sources, for example, coins, engravings. So I've given you an engraving here of the Comtesse de Provence, and it does have the same coat of arms right here. Um, so probably the most likely owner would be um, either of these sisters, the Comtesse de Provence or the Comtesse d'Artois. Um, Clotilde de France is actually the person I originally hit upon. Um, she's probably a little bit less likely, 
because the wife's coat of arms was typically on this side here where we see the Savoy coat of arms. So hers would probably be flipped, but I haven't found anything of hers yet to, um, to count her out. Um, and then the other thing that really establishes this connection is in kind of, I recently discovered in the past five to 15 years, there were several books auctioned at Sotheby's in Paris um, that are listed as belonging to some to the Comtesse de Provence, some to the Comtesse d'Artois. And they all have the same coat of arms here. It's not the same stamp. None of them have the same rose border, um, but because the coat of arms are the same, um, that does establish the connection pretty well. And it probably is one of the women rather than one of the men in the family because the men would oftentimes just use um, the fleur-de-lis and not use their wife's insignia. Uh, so kind of looking at um, these women as our sort of potential suspects for this book, I think the next question is why this book? Why are they interested um, in purchasing this particular item? So to give you a little bit about the text. So this adaptation of Antigone um, was written by Jean-Francois Marmentel. He was an Enlightenment thinker and a secretary of the French Academy. So a very established figure, certainly someone they would have been familiar with. Um, and in terms of revolutionary politics, he was a moderate. Like a lot of Enlightenment thinkers, he was speaking about societal regeneration. But he also, a little bit later on, spoke out against the terror, the execution of the king. Um, so he's, he's kind of walking in the middle line here. And that may seem kind of a little bit at odds, but the Enlightenment really was the intellectual culture of the French court at this time. And all of these women would have come of age within that culture. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on the story of Antigone, if you're not familiar, this is the um, third and final installment in um, the Oedipus trilogy. So this comes from an ancient Greek tragedy by Sophocles. And where we start off with Antigone, this is a story about the downfall of the royal kingdom of Thebes. Um, Antigone's father, the king Oedipus, um, Antigone is our female protagonist, um, her father Oedipus, um, the king has recently died. Her uncle Creon is now the king. Antigone has two brothers um, who are quite disobedient, have started kind of the civil war in which they have both died. And Creon is very angry and he feels very betrayed by them. And he declares that they are not going to perform the funeral rites for these bodies. They're just going to leave them out to rot. And Antigone is loyal to her uncle, the king, but she really disagrees with this. And she goes against his back and she buries the bodies anyway. And as a result, she is sentenced to death. And really the crux of this play is everyone kind of coming up to Creon in turn, begging him to relent, to show mercy, and he refuses. As a result, she dies. Several other family members die from grief. So these really interesting themes around loyalty, authority, abuse of power, justice. And so it's a really great choice for this period at the start of the French Revolution um, when they're having conversations about these same issues. And it's, it's early on the revolution, so it's not at all evident how things are going to go. And in his adaptation, Marmontel really sticks to the original story. But he does emphasize the transition of Creon the king from a merciless ruler, ruler to one who regrets his cruelty. Um, he writes that the opera should culminate with a dance celebrating peace and clemency. So it's a moral progression that emphasizes the failings of monarchy while also pointing to its dream ability. Um, he's upholding royal authority and also saying that maybe there's room for a moral reckoning at the same time. So it strikes this middle ground that we can perhaps think of as appealing to both royalist and revolutionaries at this very fraught moment. And just like his text, um, the whole culture around opera um, isn't necessarily um, a royalist or revolutionary thing at this point. I think oftentimes we think of opera as being very elite and certainly there were lavish performances at the Paris Opera and at Versailles for the royal court. Um, however, revolutionaries really keyed in um, early on on the pedaga uh, pedagogical value of opera and its potential to teach civic virtue. So in the spring of 1790, Antigone is being performed on stage at the Paris Opera, and the theater is undergoing a transition from royal control to administration under the new National Assembly, the revolutionary government, which deemed it essential 
to the Republic because of its cultural, commercial, and symbolic value. A few years later, um, they end up decreeing that there should be free revolutionary tragedies performed for all several times a week. There's this whole outpouring of people writing tragedies with this very kind of explicit revolutionary theme. Um, so we're really at a turning point um, in terms of theater culture and a work like Antigone that's moralistic, but still quite politically ambiguous, makes a lot of sense for this period of transition. So to bring things back um, to the object itself, just like the opera, the Parisian public publishing sector was undergoing a transition at this time. So for a long time, um, under the king and queen, um, it was under the control of royal censors. And so what that meant was that in order for a book to be legally printed, um, it had to kind of go under the eye of a royal censor who would read the book, make sure there wasn't anything that they didn't like that was objectionable in it. And then they would issue a statement of royal privilege, which would usually appear on the frontispiece of the book. And very early on in the revolution, this whole system comes under debate. Um, and by August of 1790, it was abolished. So we know that Antigone is performed um, on stage in April, 1790. So really kind of in a legal no man's land in terms of um, when this is printed. And unlike other books printed by the publisher, um, you'll see on the French species here, there is no statement of privilege. So the publisher identifies himself as P. de Lormel, and he had a long-standing record of printing librettos, both for performances of the Paris Opera um, and for performances for the royal court. Um, so definitely probably someone with a noble clientele. But as the tides start changing, his printing also really starts to change. So the same year, 1790, he prints a copy of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Um, and then some books start to show up that are critical of the monarchy. They don't have any publisher's name on them, um, which is kind of common for books that are maybe objectionable, but they are linked um, as being perhaps printed by him. So Antigone really um, kind of is an artifact of his passage from a more established noble clientele um, to these totally new markets that are coming about because of the revolution. And I think that the stylistic choices he makes printing Antigone do reflect that. Um, so if you take a look at the paper, it's fairly ordinary quality um, with luxury printers like Baskerville in this period. You see really beautiful, lush, steamrolled papers. Um, none of that here, this probably would have been something be fairly affordable to a range of buyers. Um, and then in terms of decoration, he's using a few decorative bars and vignette in the Rococo style. Um, that would have been sort of popular with books purchased by the royal court, but he doesn't quite go overboard with it either. Um, the biggest direct um, decorations are relief headers for the start of each act. Um, I'm going to need two of them right here on the left. And these both use um, this bourbon fleur de leaf motif quite strongly. This one is um, down here is entirely fleur de lis, even in the background. And then for the first act, we have this crown, we have some military elements as well. The final um, header, which I don't show you, is just a decoration of flowers. So it's kind of an interesting choice for this political moment. It could be totally coincidental that he used whatever headers he had available at the time this was printed. It could also be a deliberate choice to kind of um, be sort of working two markets, both this, this noble market and these um, new publics that are coming around with the revolution. But in either case, the contrast between this wireless decoration and a quite ordinary paper just serves to, to heighten the contradictions that are already present in this work. So to conclude, I'm gonna give you a little bit about what happened um, to all of these women. So unlike a lot of people in their family, they did all survive the French Revolution. So Clotilde here on the far end was already living in Italy with her husband when the revolution started, although French Revolution forces invaded the Savoy in 1792, which quickly brought things a lot closer to home for her. And she became Queen of Sardinia in 1796 when her husband became king. And her husband really struggled with the responsibilities of being king. So she really took on the lion's share of responsibility. She was known for being 
quite determined um, and strong-willed. Um, and she died in 1802. The Comtesse d'Artois here in the center was one of the very first people to escape the French Revolution right after the storming of the Bastille in 1789. So um, her husband, um, the Comte d'Artois, due to his friendship with Marie Antoinette was extremely unpopular in France. And so it was felt best um, that they leave immediately. And they ended up joining Clotilde at the Royal Court of the Savoy in Turin. And just um, a little while later in 1791, the Comte and Comtesse de Provence turned up there as well. And they actually fled Paris on the same night in 1791 that Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were also trying to make an escape attempt. However, they took different routes. The Comte and Comtesse de Provence escaped. Um, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette did not. They were brought back to Paris where they were later imprisoned. So in this period, um, sort of in the French Revolution Napoleonic era, the Bourbon family lives quite kind of nomadically throughout Europe everywhere from England to Russia where they could find refuge. Both the Comtesse de Provence and the Comtesse d'Artois had very strange relationships with their husbands, were estranged from them for long periods, and they both died abroad during the reign of Napoleon. Um, and so in 1814, Napoleon begins to fall from power and the Comte de Provence, who had for a long time had aspirations of replacing his brother as king, seizes his moment, returns to France to restore the Bourbon monarchy, declares himself King Louis XVIII. And upon his death, the Comte d'Artois, his brother, ruled as the King Charles X until the revolution of 1830, um, when the Bourbons really fall from power once and for all in France. And when Louis XVIII um, returned to France, he brought with him Marie Therese de France, who was the only surviving child of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. So I've given you another little family tree here. Um, so I know there's a lot of people and they all kind of have the same name. Um, and Marie Therese, she was the only person in her family to survive the temple prison where she was held in Paris for three years. Um, she was also known for being quite strong-willed and determined at one point. Um, she was there when she was a teenager. She refused to speak for about the course of an entire year despite her captors. And when she was released, she married her cousin, the Duke de Angleham, um, the son of the Comte and Comtesse d'Artois. Um, and Louis the, the 18th quite admired her and he referred to her as the new Antigone. And so when they return victoriously to Paris in 1814, he brings her to the Paris Opera where they watch a performance of Oedipus at Collins. And in the Oedipus trilogy, Oedipus at Collins is the story that precedes Antigone. And it's kind of the story of Oedipus the King and his daughter Antigone and Antigone being um, quite loyal and really standing by her father, the king. And at the Paris Opera there in 1814, both King Louis XVIII and his niece Marie Therese received a standing ovation from the audience. For me, that moment really illustrates the multitude of interpretations around Antigone as a text. While it may have inspired revolutionaries on the Paris stage in 1790, for the Bourbons, this ancient tale is also a literary model which reaffirmed their own tragedy and their own royal status. And Antigone, I think, really is the perfect story for this family. It's about a downfall brought about by stubbornness and refusal to compromise, much like their own fall from power, about the conflict between youth and tradition, rivalries between family members, and above all, the lasting impact of a young woman's courage. Thank you all very much. I'd like to thank Dr. Jacqueline Misakia, Ruth Rogers, and Mariana Oler at Wellesley. Thank you, Megan. Um, it looks like we have a question in the chat for you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so um, she says, thank you for this excellent paper. 
Um, she says that I know that you are still researching, uh, but do you have any intuition or feeling about who was the owner? Or do you have hopes that a particular favorite owned the libretto? That's a really good question. Um, so it's a little hard to, I would really hope to find um, some other books that if I found one that had this exact same stamp with the rosettes, then I think I would know for sure. Um, it's possible that some more books uh, might pop up for auction in Paris, but because this family traveled everywhere and from Russia to England, they could really kind of show up anywhere, which is kind of exciting. Um, the one thing that does kind of make me wonder is um, Louis the 18th making this comment about um, the, the new Antigone that does, um, he was the husband of the Comtesse de Provence. I kind of wonder if, did he end up with her book? But of course, because this is a classical story from Sophocles, he would have been familiar with this even if he hadn't seen the particular play. So I'm not sure. Yeah, so about- um, Okay, um, we also- I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the provenance. No, it's okay. <laughs> the provenance of the object, um, how does it end up in the collection of Wellesley College? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and that's kind of where the mystery comes in. So this um, belongs to the Guy Warren Walker Jr. collection, um, which is a collection of books that are being um, held at Wellesley College. Um, they are from St. Mark's um, School in Massachusetts. Um, and they were moved to Wellesley, and I believe in the early in 1980s. So there is a, there's a pretty big gap um, in terms of how this may, may have got in here. Okay, um, so how did you first get interested in, in this topic? And what challenges did you encounter researching? So this was um, a project I did about, it was about two years ago um, for a seminar on Casanova's Europe. So we were all looking at, um, everyone in the class was assigned an 18th century book from Wellesley's special collections. Um, and I had never done provenance research. So that was a really unique challenge for me, but it definitely took me quite a long time. I um, The first time I sort of went through it, I actually really couldn't find an individual because it's definitely a bit of a learning curve in terms of even how you kind of talk about some of the certain symbols when you're putting those into to search and things like that. And then I went back at it a little bit later. Um, I did have some more success and I kind of learned that there are things like um, sort of what search sort of things to put in that places like things like coins that oftentimes have coat of arms are a really good place to look. Um, and as I said, I originally hit upon Clotilde as the individual and then it wasn't until quite recently when I was going back through this that I um, started thinking about these other two women and looking at engravings with them and seeing the match there. So it's definitely been probably one of the papers where I've just learned the most um, in terms of developing my research strategies. That's great. Um, so are there any other copies of this book um, that are in existence um, or had anyone else done research on this object in the collection at Wellesley or were you the first? Um, so I believe in terms of research at Wellesley, I, I think my this is the first, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and in terms of other copies, I have looked through the um, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, their archives to see if I could find a match. Um, and I haven't yet, but I, I would assume there probably are some out there. Um, however, this is kind of printed in a period when a lot of things unfortunately get destroyed. So it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, and then was there a certain scholar that was most influential in your research and why? Yeah, so um, actually I recently read um, Carolyn Weber's um, great book, um, Queen of Fashion, What Marie Antoinette Wore to the Revolution, which um, talks about some of these women because there actually isn't a ton of research around a lot of them just because um, they are kind of sideline figures because their, their husbands are these kings. Um, and that gave me some really great insight into these women as, um, as individuals. And then um, I don't know if we have any more questions coming in, um, but maybe you want time for one more. 
Um, oh, there is one more question. <laughs> yeah, and we do actually, this is, we have one more, we have time for literally one more question. This is perfectly timed. Can you talk a little bit about who bound these books? Um, was that done by printers as well? Yeah, so that would usually actually be done separate from the printers. When he bought the book, it would just be like the stack of papers. Um, I believe Marie Antoinette kind of had her own printer. Um, these women would have had um, probably secretaries who arranged the printing of some of these, um, but that would have been um, a separate artisan. And unfortunately, it's, it's hard to trace that person. All right, well, thank you so much again, Megan. Um, thank you. We will present for us this morning.